Hello, and welcome to Andrew Broussard Watercolors. Today we're going to do a fast and loose tonalist watercolor landscape painting. I have a quarter sheet of Stonehenge Aqua. I just coated it with water before I started the film. I put out some fresh paint. I'm not sure what um, pigments I'm going to use. So I've kind of just been going with the flow. And I think we'll just jump right into it. So let's see. I'm going to use my raw sienna to map things out. A part of me wants to explore a circular composition that might wind up happening. But I'm just going to go with the flow. I'm just going to apply my pigment, apply my paint wet and wet, let it create itself and just enjoy the painting process. My brush, I use a large um, hake brush to apply the water and either my water jar or maybe the brush itself have a little bit of pigment on it. So the water was a little muddy, but I'm not too concerned with that. Just, just relaxing, just having fun. And you are more than welcome to paint along with me. Been having a lot of projects in the works. And let's grab a little bit of light red oxide. And one of the things that I've been working on is a Kickstarter campaign to kind of just put a very linear um, exploratory YouTube series with miniature landscape painting using oil paints and different mediums mixed into it. If you'd like to check that out, I'll have a link down below and you can either support the campaign or uh, let me know if it's a good idea or not, if you would like to do that. Here's some yellow ochre. I didn't put out any fresh yellow ochre, just kind of reconstituting that. I might even grab some um, ultramarine blue for the first time this year. I put out some fresh ones. My tube, I think this is Cotman that I put out. And having not cleaned the hake brush as I grab that, you could see the grayish mud, a little push towards green. Let's put this muted color down below. A bit of raw umber, but I think ultramarine and light red oxide might be the way for me to explore. The reason I mention a circular composition, I haven't uploaded the video, but a few days ago I wanted to play around with the extreme foreground, and after doing so, I realized that I had created a circular composition and that's a composition I struggle with because I feel like sometimes you hone in on a distant shape, or at least I do, that happens, um, but there's just really not much interest taking place on where your eye is drawn. So I played around with some washes in that circle that was created. I felt like that helped things out. I think I want a little bit of raw umber in this mix. I'm throwing some of that in the sky. Let's see if we can blend 
the sky and to the earth. I'm going to take a paper towel and push some stuff around, add some lights, add some clouds, and some movement. There we go. If I pull back here to the white of the paper, pull out a little bit of a highlight, I'll make this a watery area. And we'll push down and around the whitest white. And those colors that are appearing in the sky, just bring them down below. None of the pigments I've used so far are staining. In fact, the only really staining pigment I have on the palette is the Thalo Blue, and I don't think that's going to get utilized. All right, I like to grab the paper towel sometimes and stretch it out to a wide lift oh a little add I haven't mentioned this in a while burnt sienna right here but uh, burnt umber um, I paint flat for the most part maybe the table has a one degree tilt towards me it's just an art table um, but the reason I mention that, I was reading, I absolutely love John Singer Sargent and his uh, portrait work. And I really love the portrait drawings that he did, the charcoal and the pencil. And I remember reading, I'm going to grab some lamp black, that he recommended everybody have a, a plumb bob, you know, to hold up and see the vertical straight line. And I think there's kind of like an annotated uh, type reading that I was looking at, where the author had mentioned that, or maybe John Singer Sargent himself had mentioned that everybody kind of has a tendency to move their vertical a little bit left or right. And that for me always happens with the light in the sky to bring it down right below it. I never seem to match those up right away. I'm going to pull the excess moisture out from the bottom, just from that edge. I'm going to play around in here. Um, the background on the sky, I think that I should just leave it as such and not um, kind of fiddle piddle around in it. And we'll see how it dries and the softness to it. And then from there, overlay uh, tree formations. So this is a mixture of lamp black, uh, raw umber, burnt umber, just my darker pigments. I'm going to grab my scraping tool made by Mr. Mark, but I'm not going to scrape to the point of damaging the paper. I'm just going to push these puddles around. I had mentioned 
in because I had put it created a video I didn't put it up yet that I grabbed some pigment in that one and pushed it up into different areas rather than scraping just getting the idea of scrapes so I think that um, kind of a different realm of scraping happening and I'll um, expound upon that while I just gently push this around so with scraping you can use the card and we'll simplify it to a round edge and a sharp edge. Uh, sharp edge, you can really dig into the paper and you get those back fills. Round edge can be like the back of a fingernail and create kind of a push and an opening. And if you're at a point of um, damp within the paper where it's not super wet, it'll create um, white lines and you can use wider cards for those scrapes and you can see here I have a wider flat that wants to create some movement but then the type of scraping I'm playing around with is, is more of a movement of the pigment to drag from one spot to another. Uh, the reason I'm kind of like really honing in and harping on that is that the lamp black, when applying it wet and wet, if I use a strong application of it, or if an area is strong on the hake brush, that area might dry a little splotchy and Payne's Gray has the same effect. So I would look for those spots and kind of push that pigment out of that, um, that mark. So I hope that's making sense. I had planned today's, um, my birthday. I had planned on doing uh, some portrait exploration. I might do that after this painting. We'll see. We're just, um, frankly, really exhausted for my birthday today. Uh, yesterday, I had wanted to longboard a mile for every, you know, year for my birth year. So yesterday, I longboarded 36 miles. Sorry, 37 brush hair right there. I'm trying to pull up. Tweezers are good for that, but I don't have tweezers in the art room. Anyway, um, so I went 37 miles and it was 47, 40-ish degrees Fahrenheit temperature-wise, and it was raining, and the wind from the north was 15 miles per hour. So it was absolutely just quite miserable <laughs> quite I'm I don't know I guess I'm glad I did it and that it's over and done with but um, it was exhausting here's some lamp black and you could see how it'll want to group up in there what would be fun is if we grab some strong yellow ochre and feed that in that'll really add some character so some of the pushing that I had done didn't create, um, we're kind of going over some of that, which is fine. I think that exploration is what's important. Let's see, how do I want to approach this area? Let's 
The sky is still very wet. This is a quarter sheet, so 11 by 15. If this was to be matted, a mat, the inside is about 10 and 5 eighths by uh, 13 and 5 eighths. So it would come to about an edge right here. I like to paint to the sides just to cover the whites and also gives me a little bit of movement, a little bit of opportunity to move around. I'm not sure why the size papers that are available and the tears that we can get from them aren't more in line with mat sizes and vice versa. I do believe I have a way to tear for um, 8x10 openings, but um, it's kind of inconvenient. Let's see if I want to push anything around with them. Um, the number one. I'm not even adding any uh, pigment to this. I'm just pushing. So when I dry and it softens, my goal is to have a sense of depth even in the foreground rather than just a layer of trees. Though, from the tonalist standpoint, I think it would be perfectly fine to have the said silhouette against these trees. I do like that background. Yeah, so just kind of physically exhausted today and then just um, mentally exhausted. Um, at the same time, some of my online longboarding buddies, they get together in Florida once a year and they do it in Netherlands too but I think it got skipped this year or somebody else has to take over it where they do an ultra skate and they go for 24 hours straight along a racetrack and um, this year I think one person went over 300 miles in 24 hours on a longboard pushing which is I just cannot imagine. I, one buddy that I talked to, he said he took a seven hour nap afterwards. I think he did. Um, 177 miles. So congratulations to Zach. Well, let me pause this. We'll do a dry off. We're going to look for our shift in value and see how things look. All right. So I feel this is important to talk about still feels a little damp to the touch, but you can see how extreme this tonal shift was. Sky, background, very happy with. The foreground lightened significantly. So for me, there's kind of two approaches. You can play around in the wet and wet and keep on going, keep on going for like 40 minutes, maybe an hour. And it'll slowly dry as you're painting and your values will stay truer once you do that dry off. But uh, I think we're about 18 minutes into this painting and it was very wet. Um, and we, so, so it dried and it softened quite a bit. That being said, I think there's a good, imp um, good concept to keep in mind is this. If we were to, I'm mean, use acrylic or oil paint as an example. If you were to paint a flower and you're just there in front of your palette and in front of your canvas and you grab a big old glob of paint and you do your brush stroke, brush stroke, brush stroke, you're gonna have your strokes and then you're gonna have the white of the canvas. But if you tone the canvas beforehand and then create your strokes on top of that, you're gonna have uh, just a more complete feel to it and you can use this to that effect rather than painting trees on a white surface. And then if we don't cover it completely, which the goal is to not cover it completely, we'll then be able to have a sense of um, texture and depth and really have uh, something fun happening. 
just grabbing a little inkling of water. Just trying to get this going. I had pulled all the moisture out of the hake brush with a paper towel. And we really don't need much moisture in there at this point. While I was doing the dry off, I decided that I really wanted my horizon, not my horizon, the edge of the water about here to have the more crisp texture taking place. Um, I think an important skill is to know your strengths and weaknesses and to be honest with yourself about them and to then push past those. Some people might say, um, maybe if you don't address your strengths and weaknesses, you then have no limitations on yourself and you can then explore completely. So that's probably just an equally valid philosophy. Uh, so whatever works for you, mentality-wise, as long as you're using it as a way to continue painting and not as a crutch. And anyway, so my weakness is that I will work in this stage, and if I put trees in, they're going to get bigger, 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 and then they're going to engulf the scene. And that's something that I'm always trying to be aware of. So that's the reason that I mentioned that. And that's why I, while drying off, was setting myself that limitation of how high that's going to go up. I'm going to play around with some tree work. And I'm going to cross over into the sky. But I know I have to be careful. So we'll pull in a little bit of tree here. So you can see the pre-existing softened tree. And even right there, I start to extend past the pre-existing softened. And that could be, like I said, my, my tendency to create those larger trees. This fellow might not even make the final cropping. But I do enjoy these type of tree lines. Soon it'll be about a year since the last time I sat down and did a whole bunch of um, study sessions of master paintings and the time period that I enjoy 1800s to 1900s uh, Hudson River Valley into the um, the tonalists and they go from big and grandiose grandiose to um, to small single tree elements but that tree line is always kind of a popular motif it might be worth doing an off-centered tree texture on this edge, just kind of getting how I want to create this. And let me know in the comments below, at what point would you stop this one? Would you have stopped it right here? So that's the first question. Would you stop it here? I think I'm 
to map out a bush here. So let me know what you think. Do you like this? And if so, why? If not, why? And I'll kind of give my idea and reasonings for it. So, my ideas and reasonings. Take the chances and see what could happen. So that's my first idea. The second is that obviously this is the point of interest right here in the painting. The light and the, um, the reflection. And we have the most intense reds right there. So would a tree element stop the eye from going further in that direction? I'm using the side of the rigger just to kind of stamp out, rather than drawing a straight line, uh, stamping out textured straight lines. I'm grabbing the raw sienna for this. I like using the raw sienna as a uh, makeshift black. And in fact, our lines are going to point to here. If we were to go more strict in our background, we'd have the lines point here. And then in theory, any type of tree elements could point back to that spot as well as we come along this edge. And anything that we have here can come up and larger. One thing that I've read about, so, so that's a lot of the different ideas of what I'm thinking about now. And while I do that application, I'm going to talk about kind of a theory and idea that I don't quite understand. And it's something that I need to read over and look at some more. Um, Burge Harrison, 1909 a painter, teacher, and proponent of tonalism had talked about kind of a, I don't know if he had referred to it as a refraction or a vibration of the painting. And I think that in a more recent, not a book, but an article, uh, the 12 or I think the 13, identifying characteristics of tonalism, talk about a movement on the surface of the uh, the painting, where Mr. Harrison talks about either putting down, I'm not sure if it was the cooler um, use, and then painting the warmer use on top, and that created a, some sort of a vibration on the surface, or if it was a vice versa. And why am I bringing that up? I'm losing my train of thought. That was kind of like an overall application on a painting itself. Anyway, I hope this uh, video is interesting, though it is a little loosey-goosey in the ideas. And I'm getting a little more specific with tree movement. that area too much. There we go. 
let's see. Kind of a soft, gentle landscape. Usually I paint dark and moody. And I think um, the earth tones in the sky that add more color, the yellow ochre, the, um, the light red oxide, start pulling away from that moodiness when they're um, unmixed, uncorrupted. Even though that's not the meaning behind it, it's just more, um, I think my enjoyment of the fact that the earth pigments can look like a yellow and look like a red, as opposed to using a cad red or a cadmium yellow. The um, ultramarine Which is what originally lapis lazul, the ground stone, and then they came up with a synthetic of it. I don't know what was used for blue before that. I was watching a video, just some random YouTube art history uh, videos, and the advent of Prussian blue was a lot more recent than I had thought. It was like the 18th, the 1700s. So. I don't know what blues they had on hand back in the 1500s. I don't even think I'm going to connect these guys to much trees. Let's just give that silent vibration let's see let's do a dry off all right so i'm going to stop this one here but i'm going to end this video with some thoughts and ideas for y'all um with these videos first and foremost you are always welcome to follow along you have my express permission to sign your own name and to sell anything you do when you follow any of my videos. You are more than welcome to. And in fact, uh, tag me on uh, Instagram or uh, Facebook or shoot me a message. I'd love to see what you paint. But if you want to follow along with this and take things further, I talked about how we have our center of interest here. We can bring the eye. You could really play around with the top of a tree line. We could have um, changed the angle of the colors in the sky itself if you really wanted to get to the obvious of pointing here. You could play around in this tr um, foreground with scraping, scraping out rocks that come up and over, even branches that come up or logs that sit out in that fashion. Or you could even have logs go the other way if you want to start um, really creating that inside shape. You can argue that we have the triangles set up here, but I've never had an eye for the triangle arrangements, but you can hear, and then we have the overlapping triangles taking place. So, I mean, within art theory, there's a lot of things happening. Um, I don't think it's necessary for a painter to get too bogged down into those in the beginning. And, and this is my personal opinion. It's just a matter of paint, 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 explore, 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 and have fun and just, uh, just constantly explore different things. So thank you to everybody that supports this channel. Um, of course, please like subscribe, follow. Thank you. Everybody that supports on uh, Patreon. I really appreciate all your help. I, well, that money goes back into art supplies. And if you're interested in these videos, um, I am working on crowdsourcing uh, funding for an oil painting series. So you can check out that link down below to the Kickstarter. You all take care and have a great day. Thank you.